So uh, I hope you enjoyed my nuts. And uh, with your grace present, that's no double entendre there. So I'm just going to start by uh, taking my blood sugar because I haven't eaten now since Sunday. And uh, no, it's nothing to do with Ramadan. I'm just taking one for the team. And it's 5.3, which is normal. So how on earth can my blood sugar be normal uh, with no food inside me? And I'm going to come back to that. Um, that'd be good. OK, so uh, a slide has been skipped already. So uh, thanks very much to, uh, to Nuffield. Um, it is a uh, core value of Nuffield is critical thinking and, and, and out of the box and all those cliches. And uh, I, I'm so glad uh, that uh, I, I got that opportunity 15 years ago. Um, thanks to uh, two doctors who are uh, sharing their data with me today. Uh, David Unwin is a, um, a GP over in Southport and he's a very quiet and self-effacing man, but he's absolutely revolutionising uh, patient care. And uh, Timothy Noakes is uh, a world-renowned sports scientist. If you've ever heard of uh, carving up, well, that was him. Uh, unfortunately, however, about uh, five years ago, he realised that he'd got his nutritional model completely wrong. And he spoke about it openly, and he's got into an awful lot of trouble. And, uh, in fact, last year he spent nearly all of it in court having to descend, uh, defend his U-turn in beliefs and, um, uh, and, uh, and his data, uh, presenting his data. And only last month, finally, was he fully vindicated and um, by extension his data, of which I'm going to share with you today. Um, so why me? Why on earth am I uh, uh, standing here before you today? Well, essentially a lifelong interest in nutrition, uh, particularly pertaining to sport. And I found my old training journal from 30 years ago today. And if you see halfway down, I really was low-fat mat. Uh, the porridge and the muesli would have been skim milk, the uh, chicken would have been skinless, and there would have been a low-fat marge on the, um, on the breads. But my, the particular interesting thing that I hadn't realised was 30 years ago I was having carbo drinks, which was directly related to what uh, Timothy Noakes was espousing back then. Um, and lest you think this is not uh, my training journal, that was me 30 years ago. <laughs> and all I can say is that, uh, that you're lucky that this conference is not on Friday because the next page in my uh, training journal said aerobics. And uh, I can imagine that, uh, uh, well, uh, Roger, you would not want to see me in my leotard. Or perhaps you would. I'm not judging. <laughs> so, okay, so why, why did I come to change my mind? Um, <clears throat> there were lots of stories creeping in about three, four years ago about, from the athletic community, but the main driver was my daughter, who grew up a skinny little thing, and under my uh, low-fat, uh, high-carb regime uh, that I was uh, uh, talking about. Sorry, I, I, did I... Ah, oh, the speaker. Sorry, I've got it. Great, thanks. Under the... Um, yeah, she started to put on a lot of weight. I mean, a lot of weight. And um, eventually became pre-diabetic. And casting around for... Um, for some answers. Actually, uh, Roger, could I have some, a drink of water? Oh, sorry. And in, cast, in, a, in casting around for some, um, for some answers, I came across this lot. Because they too had been casting around for answers. Because they had seen between what they uh, found in their clinical practice and what they learnt at medical school just did not correlate. And... Um, uh, so, and these people, just in case you're interested, are actually speaking in Manchester next week on that very point. But um, alone, they, you might just write them off as a nutter, but collectively they made a very, very uh, strong case. So, um, so let's go back to my, why, am I, uh, why haven't I you know, eaten? What, what about my blood sugar? What, what's that all about? Um, the reason my blood sugar is fine without eating for three days is because my body's doing exactly what it evolved to do. It's taking the fat back out of my adipose tissue and it's burning it as fuel. 
um, if you like, an agricultural metaphor. My body's now running on diesel, whereas before I was trying to run it on easy start. You know, I am now running on fat. Now, let's look at a, couple, a few other people who are running on fat. This is Sam, Sammy Inken, and he's the, or was the world uh, triathlon champion. And he's rowing across a chunk of the Pacific here uh, with his wife. And uh, he is a largely, 70% uh, of his diet is fat. This is Mike Morton. Uh, he holds the current record for the longest run in one day. It's about 172 miles, I think, something like that. There are many, 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 many athletes now who, who are converting this way. Now, why is that a not surprise to me? It's because if we take our, the, the, our hominid evolution as a 24-hour clock, then we did not start, um, or uh, it was only until five minutes to midnight did carbohydrates in any great quantity turn up in our diet and only five seconds to midnight did sugar and vegetable oils turn up. Um, now, in the story of, uh, or in the words, I should say, of um, uh, Harvard professor of human evolution, Daniel Lieberman, everybody here, we evolved as persistence hunters. Okay? Everybody here has the biomechanics that mark you out as endurance killers. Now, I know we don't like to think of it that, that way, but our species has su such unique adaptations that you cannot conclude uh, anything else. And uh, just preempting your first question, Stephen, even you. <laughs> so, if we, uh, and we know from contemporary accounts, when we still, for people who still live and hunt this way, uh, when we make a kill, the first thing we do is eat the fat. Then we eat the organs, and often the lean cuts get discarded. Now, if we evolved with animal fats, why on earth did we start demonizing them? And the story is incredibly recent. It's only 60 years old, and it's such an important story of how we come to do this, because certainly my grandparents never knew anything about our diet today. It's such an important story that I'm going to recommend a book at the end, which uh, is an award-winning title that won the Harvard uh, Book of the Year, the, uh, the um, uh, uh, Wall Street Journal, the Times, the BBC Food Programme, and it's, it's, it's a very good book. Um, so, one thing I think we can all agree on is that we came into the world on a diet rich in animal fats. I mean, we might, be, we might uh, you know, argue of how long we wean for or what we wean onto. But one thing I'm sure that our ancestors did, or whatever they weaned onto, it did not need to be fortified. So let's look at two other um, magisterial herbivores that we absolutely revere. But of course, they run on saturated fats. That's what ruminants do. All the microbes take the, take, the, uh, take the plant matter and they convert it into saturated fat before the animal absorbs it. That's how they build such big muscles. Now, we can't ruminate, so we got our fat at source. And with it, we didn't build um, big muscles, we built big brains, enormous brains, 20% of our energy for only 2% of our mass. And which is why, you know, if you take a statin, Oh, sorry, uh, so 20% of our mass. And while I'm up here, this is where most of our cholesterol resides. And which is why if you take a statin, you're likely to lose your memory. And there's a book written about it. In fact, on the, on the side effects of statins, there are lots of books uh, written about it. Unless you think that I'm digressing, it's so important because the, the, the history or the mishistory of saturated fats and cholesterol has been so intertwined like a couple of naughty boys, and it's only when you untwine them that the stories just fall apart. Cholesterol is so important to life um, that nearly every cell can produce it at source. Why would the body produce something so valuable if it was wrong? They really are absolutely as vital to life as red blood cells. Um, uh, Yes, so um, I, yes, I call, um, I call um, uh, cholesterol uh, the Severus Snape of, uh, of, of fat. You know, we thought all along it was the villain, but it's turned out to be a hero after all. Now, if you've never read Harry Potter, you have no idea what I've just said. So um, the, this, just to sum up, um, and I, I, know, I know Professor Jeb was actually uh, 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 foiled with this guy, um, uh, uh, Malcolm Kendrick, uh, Dr. Malcolm Kendrick, uh, in his words, if I can sum up this whole book in a sentence, the only reason we uh, measure cholesterol is because we have drugs that lower cholesterol. 
Now, that's such a point, potent statement, and I know a lot of people thinking, all oh, right, you know, he's just kind of lost it. Just bear with me for four more slides. Let me give you the World Health Organization, um, credible organization maybe, um, all the countries in the world, so reasonable data size. So you have um, the more cholesterol in a nation's diet, the lower the cardiovascular disease. It's an inverse correlation. Well, how about all-cause mortality, because surely that's more important. It's even greater inverse correlation. So I know what you're thinking, well, we know it's not cholesterol, it's those, it's those lipoproteins, those LDLs. How about if we take 230,000 cardiac events? Uh, it, it would be reasonable to assume that the, the LDLs would be raised. It's not the case, it's actually the opposite. So people are starting to wonder, what on earth is going on? All this contradictory evidence. So much so that I'm pleased that the uh, University of West Scotland, led by Dr. Zoe Harkham, um, they went back over all of the credible, or, and the, uh, uh, the credible uh, random control trials and the epidemiological surveys, and they let, they've, talked to, they've ta taken a long time talking to all the original authors, they've chased all the data down the rabbit holes, and this was their conclusion. The key findings, two part, two, uh, three, three quarters of the way down there, there's never, never been any evidence that links saturated fats or cholesterol to cardiovascular disease, cardiovascular disease or all-cause mortality. So what uh, is the low fat going on? Was it, just, was it just about having more of the green and less of the red? Because over the last 40 years, we've done that. Here are the metrics for 40 years. I'm sorry, this is actually the US um, uh, metrics. So I don't know what that happens in the UK. Here are the figures. Let me give you the figures. So that's, that's all up. So, the, so we've done that. And how has it turned out? Uh, so I know industry is now so cheesed off with what's coming out of our own kind of research or our, our standard channels. They're starting to, to um, uh, get their own um, programs going. And uh, I know the insurance industries, I've spoken to a guy, his, uh, for um, life insurance, they are now looking because they just can't trust the data that's coming out. And Credit Suisse, who are a reasonably good organisation, their assets are uh, over a trillion now, so they can hire the brightest and the best, and the best hire, um, uh, commission their own independent re report. And this is what they concluded. Saturated fat poses no risk. Okay? I mean, it's, that's... That's, and if you're an investor with them, don't know if anybody here is an investor with them, um, their buy orders are get into eggs, milk and dairy, and uh, their sell are uh, wheat, maize and vegetable oils. Okay, so again, what is the low fat all about? To recap, if you don't eat fat, you'll die. If you don't eat protein, you'll die. If you don't eat carbohydrates, you will have a very boring life. <laughs> but you won't die. And if you don't die, that means carbs are not an essential macronutrient. They are incredibly tasty. They pick us up, or at least make us not feel down. They're very um, uh, um, incredibly um, um, you know, user-friendly. We can package them in, in all sorts of, sorts of ways. Um, and um, above all, they're cheap which makes this wonderful model that we've all loved to come and love to grow with less a nutritional model and more of an economic one. Now, as farmers, we champion the idea that under our watch of efficiencies, we've, we've reduced the, um, the spend off of the consumer from 30% um, of take-home to 10% of take-home. But, but that's just part of the story. The bigger part of the story is all we've done is substituted the high-value um, products for the low-value products. And how's that turned out? So, once again, is this what we've done? There aren't too many variables in this equation. If we've taken out the fat, we've replaced it with something. Now, I appreciate the fact that um, I've, I've kind of said things that are, are contrary, not only to what's been said today, but contrary to what you thoroughly believe. And I, you know, so I have to give you an alternative hypothesis. And this is it. 
This is not just, this is nothing new, but this is just bubbling away, bubbling away, bubbling away, and it's only been suppressed by the people who are trying to keep the other side going. But let me just show you, I'm going to whiz through these. The reason it's important is because now there are very credible papers that link it to. Uh, so that's cardiovascular disease, uh, MIs, heart attacks, cancer, cancer, Alzheimer's, and it's a great predictor of mortality. But the most important thing about insulin resistance is this. This, this only came up at a conference last, uh, last month in Colorado. So insulin resistance is upstream and linearly correlated to all of the metabolic markers that have been creating, that we know creates all of the, um, so the downstream of uh, Alzheimer's and type 2, etc. But all these metabolic markers, the uh, HDLs, the LDLs, the triglycerides, but it's linearly correlated. So they move together both positively and negatively, but they're linear. Therefore, this is upstream. And if this is true, if this is upstream, then why have we spent 60 years and billions of pounds looking at this? Maybe we just need to look in a different place. I know we have the brightest minds and the best minds, but we may be just looking in the wrong place. OK, let me just quickly zip through these. OK. Uh, you're very polite with your silence while I rearrange my notes here. So, yeah, just let me t tell you about two, um, two particular... Um, I've been messing about this diet for, five, for, for two years now. As you can see, my trousers keep slipping down. And... Um, <laughs> As, as, uh, as Professor Jeb, you know, one of the problems with, with any of this, it, you've got to be so subjective, it's t too subjective, and I don't want to, you know, give you, well, this is what's happened to me, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, okay. Uh, but uh, the, the two things I think, I think I can mention, one is this, and it's kind of a bit of a personal thing, really, is, and, uh, and, and one of shame, is that um, I now realise that the model that I have kind of drilled into everybody all my life is the calories in, calories out, the energy balance. That's as useful as half a bridge. Hormones really are the other half, and I just did not realise this, particularly insulin. And, which the, and this means, and this is really my ad admission, is that for all those people I've judged for being overweight by the old model, it really was not their fault. If you have the genetics that, presuppose, that predispose you um, to insulin or, or hormonal issues, you never stood a chance on the Western diet. You never stood a chance. It was never your fault. And I can just say how sorry I am if I've ever judged you. Chokes me up. But, um, you know, that old sloth, uh, the Old Testament of sloth and, of, and gluttony, you know, that says more about the accuser than it does the accused. And um, secondly, uh, one thing I do know, um, this is really good for agriculture. From my own, uh, uh, my, my, I spend about 20% more now on, um, on my food, maybe more. And all of my people, my, my friends and all these guys who I mentioned earlier, they're all doing the same. That has got to find its way back to the, to the farm gate. And I know we, talk, we touched on this earlier. The government is paranoid about that, but we just need to reframe the question. Okay, that's it. That's where we've got to reframe it. So, um, this is the old chestnut, isn't it? The food industry pays no attention to health. But that's the real question. Pay the farmer now or pay the pharmacy later. So, I know you came here, a lot of people, have, you, you, you cannot help coming, coming through life without prejudgments. But I like to think if you were, if you were the jury in my favourite film and I'm Henry Fonda, I like to think I've now got reasonable doubt. You know, we've looked at some athletic uh, uh, ideas, we've looked at the, uh, the data, we've looked at uh, credible alternatives, uh, we've looked at uh, what the, the industry uh, perspective is. But there's one more piece of evidence, and that's this guy. Okay, he's David Unwin, and I mentioned him right at the start. He's just won the NHS Innovator of the Year Award, and uh, because he's managed to get all of his long-term patients who die, die, uh, type 2 diabetics off their medication, okay? And inadvertently, all their weight's gone as well. 
Now, one of, the model, one of the problems with this model, of course, he does it for free. And we know how, how people value things for free. But to me, this is really the new gold rush because my daughter recently spent £3,000 just having a tea straightened. Imagine what people would spend to get their lives back. OK, this is a book I mentioned at the start, uh, The Big Fat Surprise, uh, uh, award-winning book, and even the British Medical Journal said of it, Deeply disturbing in showing how over-enthusiastic scientists, poor science, massive conflict of interest, and politically driven policymakers can make such uh, deeply damaging mistakes. That's why I need to buy this book. Okay, I'm just gonna, all I'm going to mention about is the fourth, uh, the fourth thing. Please just don't go out and give up cards, uh, give up carbs. That's, that's not what I'm trying to say, and I haven't had time to, to I need more time to talk about that. Further reading is required. If you need further re reading, um, that's the place to go. That's the public, that's the uh, depository, repository of all, uh, <laughs> of, all uh, of all knowledge on this subject. Uh, and finally, uh, people say, well, what do you eat? Um, top right is my favourite, which is chicken fajitas on a cos lettuce. And finally... Yes, of course I do. I'm not that stupid. Thank you. <laughs>